Oh, oh, welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles humans behind the big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future and future creators. And for all those that like really great stories, I'm Ira Pastor, your uh, life sciences ambassador along for the journey. Uh, so as a bit of introduction, uh, a generic drug, uh, is a pharmaceutical drug that ultimately contains the same chemical substance uh, as a drug that was originally protected by a chemical patent and typically allowed for sale after the patents on the original drugs expire. Uh, once uh, generic drugs enter the market, competition often leads to substantially lower prices for both uh, the original brand name and obviously its generic equivalents. Uh, in 2014, uh, it was estimated that about 88% of the 4.3 billion prescriptions filled in the United States alone uh, were for generic drugs, and generic drugs alone saved around $250 billion uh, in healthcare costs that year. A global market for generics is estimated to be over $500 billion next year, and that's up from around $350 billion in 2016, so substantial uh, growth rates there. Uh, However, uh, in recent years, things have been a bit amiss in the generic drug segment, uh, where why we've been seeing a rapid rise in price for many generic drugs that have been around for years, if not decades. Uh, there has been major consolidation uh, in the generic drug industry with a handful of companies dominating some actually units of uh, a big pharma. Uh, and there is an estimated backlog of literally thousands of generic drugs awaiting approval at FDA. Uh, all of these factors have played a role in uh, how both rare and common drugs, uh, and many people may be familiar with, say, the EpiPen story, uh, can shoot up in price uh, dramatically. Uh, we're honored today uh, to be joined by Dan Lillenquist, who uh, is an American businessman, former politician who served in the Utah State Senate, and is the lead architect and board chairman of Civica RX, which is a nonprofit generic drug company that was established to reduce chronic generic drug shortages and price gouging. Uh, Dan currently serves as Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Intermountain Healthcare, which is a nonprofit healthcare system, which is the largest healthcare provider in the Intermountain West area of the United States. Uh, it provides hospitals and other medical services in Utah. Uh, Idaho and Nevada has 37,000 employees, uh, and he oversees uh, Intermountain's enterprise initiatives, market intelligence and planning offices, and Intermountain was one of the founding groups behind Civica RX. Uh, Dan has degrees in economics from Brigham Young University, law degree from the University of Chicago. Uh, all that being said, Dan, uh, thanks for taking the time to, to come on the show today and talk for us for a little while. Hi, Rob. Great to be with you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so, so typically we start off, we, we give our guests the floor for a little bit just to, uh, you know, talk a little about who you are. If you can take us uh, sort of back to the beginning about sort of how you developed uh, an interest in economics, uh, in law, and, and maybe a little bit into uh, the 2000s where you experienced uh, something that none of us ever, hopefully ever experienced, but a, a plane crash. Uh, and a little bit about how uh, all these components of your uh, your life led up to sort of what you're doing now. Thank you, and I'm happy to share it. Uh, uh, not often you have an interested party in, in your bio biographical background, but um, just, um, yeah, so I grew up in Idaho Falls. My dad's an endocrinologist, and my mother was a was an elementary school teacher, but, and then when she started her family, um, focused on all of us, and um, I grew up in a large family. My parents had nine children, and then adopted, adopted six boys. Um, and so it was a very large family. In fact, uh, when I um, first took office in the Utah State Senate, it felt like uh, group dynamics have always been part of my life. So I felt, um, I felt at ease, but uh, I grew up in Idaho Falls. I, I went to school at Brigham Young University and um, I ended up uh, taking a freshman economics class and uh, it was my hardest class my freshman year. I barely got an A. Uh, it almost cost me my scholarship if I, if I came down to the last exam and after serving a, um, a mission for my church, I, I, I came back and I thought, you know, I want to, I'm going to major in my, the toughest subject that, that, uh, uh, that I took my freshman year because I want to teach myself to, to think that way. And, and I really loved it. I, I majored in economics. Um, 
I was a teaching assistant for five semesters in econ. And, and the reason I share this is I do think the, the insights around the market failures for Civica really came out of this. Sure. I went to the University of Chicago Law School because of their economics focus and, and really um, I thought that I might one day serve in public office down the road, really wanted to have that grounding. But I realized that after spending a lot of money on my, my legal degree that I didn't like billing in six minute increments <laughs> and measuring my life that way. So I actually used my law degree more like an MBA and uh, launched my career with Bain Consulting in their Dallas office. Um, spent a couple of years there, spent a few years working in the Fortune 500 world doing strategy. Um, and then um, left in uh, 2005 and kind of my early 30s to, to be the president of a uh, business process outsourcing company and in the process of that, um, uh, built up that company, uh, but, but um, decided I was going to run for the state Senate. And it just so happened that the senator who was representing my area was retiring. He hadn't told anybody he was retiring. And, um, and uh, when he found I was interested, I encouraged me to run. And, and I ended up uh, winning the primary election in, in June of 2008. And uh, just about a month after that, um, the company, uh, my company, we, we would do humanitarian service, um, you know, it's just part of our culture. And um, I went down to Guatemala with um, four of my employees and we met up with another party down there, got on a small uh, Cessna caravan, 14 seat plane um, in August, on August 24th of 2008. And about 45 minutes into an hour and 20 minute flight, our, our engine, failed um, and we crashed into um, really essentially the jungle of Guatemala and um, 11 to 14 people died and it, but for where I was sitting on the plane and a decision to kind of um, stretch myself out in the back of the plane rather than balling up um, I wouldn't be here today um, I was pulled out of the plane by a couple of Guatemalan um, farmers who were just happened to see us um, um, fall out of the sky and they saved my life. Um, I would have likely burned to death in, uh, in that plane crash and ended up breaking both of my legs pretty badly and spent five weeks in a hospital, or excuse me, five days in a hospital in Guatemala and then five weeks in a hospital bed at home and in a wheelchair and a walker and months of therapy to, to be able to walk again. Um, but uh, I actually won my, won my election um, basically from my hospital bed that November and um, and then was sworn into office. I was 34 years old, sworn into office in January of um, 2009, right at the trough of the downturn. And, um, and then, um, you know, just uh, poured myself into that service. Um, one of the toughest parts about that for me, and, and I still get a little bit emotional about it, is, um, you know, all four of my employees died in that plane. And, um, and you know, as I was recovering and the families, you know, as you could understand, wanted to know what happened. Um, sure. uh, it was just hard to explain. I just said the only thing I could say to them with respect to, um, you know, you can't explain why you survived and why the people right next to you died. Um, but I just said, look, I will do everything I can to make my life count for something. And, um, and that really um, has, has been the motivator for me. And, uh, so I poured myself into service in the Senate. Um, I loved it. And um, yeah, I really made a, a, a mistake. I, I came in and, and you sit down with the Senate president when you get elected and they ask you, what, what do you want to do? And I had no idea. I just said, look, I'm, I'm pretty good with money. So put me close to the money. And um, <laughs> I ended up getting the worst committee assignments that you can get. One was to chair the retirement committee, which yeah. was going through the worst crisis that we've ever had um, with respect to public sector retirement. And then, um, and then I got the Medicaid committee and nobody wants to serve on the Medicaid committee because it's just, it's just a lot of really poor, you know, difficult choices. So, sure. but um, yeah, and I think that's where I really started diving into healthcare policy as in that committee is we were trying to figure out how to, how to make sure that, we were affording services for the disabled, for the, you know, for, for substance abuse and, and mental illness. While at the same time, the um, the resources going to the hospital and pharmaceutical sides of Medicaid were just exploding. 
And that's kind of where I really started pushing them on the healthcare side to understand how can we move to a better system that's more sustainable. Um, and just a couple more biographical things then. Um, sure. I ran for the U.S. Senate in 2012 and absolutely got destroyed by Orrin Hatch in our <laughs> primary. Um, and uh, uh, but uh, but you know I felt like um, I felt like I had accomplished with Medicaid reform and our public sector pension reform what I came to do in the Utah Senate. And um, I'm very glad I lost that race. Um, I don't think the insights that I had for Civica would have come had I not actually been through that experience. And um, but shortly after, I had a former bank colleague of mine, he was working at Intermountain Healthcare. He said, you know, you really should come work at Intermountain. At this point, I had sold my interest in my business and uh, really was not um, in a hurry to go find a job. Um, I wanted to really think about what I wanted to do. And he came at the right time and said, hey, why don't you come work here? And, and I've been here almost eight years and I absolutely love it. Um, I love what we're trying to do and and then this is where the idea of Civic came out of, um, out of um, really my work here at Intermountain Healthcare. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I, I appreciate that introduction. I really appreciate you sharing that story too, Dan, because it's uh, um, as harrowing as it may be, as you said, you know, there's, uh, as in that case of that or what you're doing now, these things happen for some reason and, um, you know, it's part of a plan and it's, it, it, at least it's where you are now and uh, there's a meaning behind it. So I, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, talking, you know, getting into sort of the theme of, of generic drugs in general, you know, obviously a lot of us um, have had our personal experiences uh, with generic drugs. I, I think maybe the first time we talked to our latest story, and I've been on uh, sort of uh, blood pressure medication for the last 20 years or so, and I've sort of been through my own personal little roller coaster when I you know, was paying for the branded product, and then I saw the generic come in, and then I saw the generics leave the market for one reason or another. So I've had this personal uh, relationship with, with generic drugs. You've had, um, obviously you might have had personal experience, but you also had provider uh, perspective in, in, in working for a major uh, organization like Intermountain, as well as, as, as an economist. Um, can you take us through some of the economic issues from a provider perspective, the sort of things that you were seeing that made you say, you know what, we need to, we need to do things a little different here because this whole branded drug, expensive, generic, cheap isn't, isn't happening. There's something off with the economic story nowadays. Yeah, sure. So I, I, I first got attuned to this, you know, after I left the Senate and started working for in a mountain, I actually was invited to write a weekly column for a local newspaper here, the Deseret News, and you know, volunteer. And I had to sit down every week and crank out 600 words that was, were cogent about a subject. I ended up writing a lot about economics. Well, that was the first when I heard about Martin Shkreli and you know the pharma bro and yep. cornering this drug Daraprim, which had been on the market for 50 years and treats. You know, it's the world-class medication that treats a very rare condition called toxoplasmosis, where you get a parasitic lung infection. And it usually affects children and people with compromised immune systems like AIDS patients. Well, yeah. you remember the story. He took a price of a drug that, is set, that sells for seven cents a pill in India and raised the price to $750 a pill. Yeah. And uh, I looked at that as an economist and saying, why does that, why in a market where that formula is owned by society, why aren't people coming in to bring that price back down? And so that's when I started thinking about it. About six months later, the EpiPen story came out. Again, epinephrine's been on the market for over a hundred years. It's, it's the, you know, it's a WHO list of essential medicines drug, right? Everybody needs epinephrine. And how was Myelin able to take that product and jack up the price by hundreds of you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars putting strain on people and why wasn't competition working? And you know what, I started thinking through, gosh, um, what are the underlying economics that, that make it difficult for somebody to come in even when the formula is owned by society? And I found in thinking about this, there are really three factors okay. that, are, that are allowing, um, that are causing market failures in the generic drug market. The first is an elastic demand, meaning when you have a drug that there's no close substitute, when you need epinephrine, yep. you don't take Tylenol, you need epinephrine. Yep. 
Um, and, and so inelastic demand, there's no close substitutes for, for these drugs. Daraprim, you know, the Martin Shkreli drug is a similar thing. If you have toxoplasmosis, you need that drug or you die. And so inelastic demand, um, which means essentially if you can corner a market, you can dictate the price because people, what, what would somebody not be willing to pay if they were dying and their drug was there, right? The second was, and this is not a surprise, there are significant economies of scale in manufacturing drugs, right? It takes years and millions of dollars to set up a production line, but the first dose you run off that production line may cost pennies. And so you're spreading the cost of the fixed cost of your upfront investment over how many doses you can sell, mm -hmm. which means the larger market share you have, the lower unit price you can get to. Absolutely. And if you're a late entrant into the market, it's really hard to get to the volumes to get your price down. Sure. Well, the third factor, and I think this was the real insight for me. In most of these markets, you only need one manufacturer to meet the entire market demand. For example, with Daraprim, you can make the entire nationwide supply of Daraprim for an entire year in about two weeks in a small room. Mm -hmm. You don't need... You don't need five manufacturers of Daraprim. You need one. Um, now, those three factors, inelastic demand, economies of scale, one manufacturer can meet the entire market demand. Those are the factors that are involved in public utilities. Think about a, a power company. You don't need two power companies in the neighborhood. There's inelastic demand and there's huge economies of scale. Well, in every environment where those factors play out, we regulate them. We regulate by having a public service commission come and set rates for the community yep. and negotiate on behalf of the people. Well, with respect to drugs, Congress doesn't do that. And um, I just run for the U.S. Senate, and I got pounded by all this external spending that came into Utah. I was going to lose two to one. I had to beat Orrin Hatch in the primary. I didn't, or excuse me, in the convention system, which I didn't. It went to a primary. And I, I was going to lose two to one. I did lose two to one, but millions of external dollars came in to really buy up advertising and beat me up. Well, it turns out later, most of that came from pharma. Yep. And so I just looked around and said, look, um, the easiest money to raise in Washington comes from pharma. It's very much about preserving the entrenched interests. And I thought there's just no way that Congress is going to actually regulate prices particularly in the generic market, because they'll say, hey, look, it's, it's free competition. Mm -hmm. So what I thought was, well, the opposite of a monopoly is a monopsony. We will essentially make a new market. Okay. We'll capitalize a not-for-profit generic drug company that we will govern like a public utility, where we will focus first on stability of supply and then appropriately pricing the product because we're interested in a sustainable long-term market. And that idea, I was at the gym on a treadmill in August of 2016, thinking about this problem. And that idea came and honestly, it was like a light switched off. I was actually gearing up to run again for political office in 2018. But the moment that idea came, I thought, okay, that's what I want to go try to do. And went home and I told my wife Brooke about it. And she said, that's the best idea I've ever heard. And, um, you know, as we talked about other health systems started pulling this together, it's been a, um, it's been a powerful idea. Um, we, we've done this through a free market approach. We didn't need any government regulation. We just choose, chose to create a new market. And um, currently, Civica, um, when we did the business modeling, we launched it in 2018. Yep. So about a couple of years later after that idea, um, and now two years into this um, endeavor, we have a third of the U.S. hospitals involved. Um, and growing, and um, we have we thought we it would take us five years to get five drugs, and in less than two years we're at forty and growing, and um, and on each of the drugs, um, we are starting to stabilize these markets and and actually bringing a a fair price um, to the market. So anyway, that's what we've done. Outstanding, outstanding, and and yeah, I, I was I was just going to go into that because I uh, you know obviously you, know, you were founded in twenty eighteen. You've brought in, um, I think it was 45 health systems representing uh, 1,200 hospitals. Um, talk a little bit, just for a minute, like, well, what was, it was a very short, short amount of time, and it seems that, I, I don't know typically how long it takes to create a monopsony, but um, 
are these health systems all over the country? Are they geographically more out west? And and what has been that? What was that process like? Because um, I can just think of all the big pharma companies that have sort of the they managed healthcare teams <laughs> that are going out to try to convince uh, uh, these healthcare groups to do one thing or another. Uh, talk about what was like putting together this. Uh, I'll say assembling a monopsony. <laughs> well, I want to be clear. This is it. it you know, this is not technically a monopsony. Sure, those are actually, that those are, yeah, I mean, it really is a, it's a purchasing co-op around right. a, around a, um, you know, not-for-profit model. Right. Now, now, how did we get people on board? Well, it was very, I think this is, to me, the most important portion of the model. Okay. Um, the reason why these, these things fail is when a health system or somebody, any business has a good idea, they're immediately trying to say, how do we monetize it? How do we monetize this? How do we make money? And our feeling was, no, this is about, this is a co core component of the healthcare we deliver at Intermountain Healthcare. I wanna stabilize, because our core business is caring for patients. Our core business is not making drugs. But if that market doesn't work for us, it's gonna hurt patients. So. The real key to Civica's success is we just basically said, we are gonna start a democratized public utility. We're gonna organize as a non-stock, non-profit corporation. Meaning, it's owned by nobody. Nobody owns Civica. Uh -huh. In fact, it's governed by health systems, but I also thought I want philanthropies involved in the governance. Because if we're successful in creating a new market, Mm -hmm. I don't want the temptation down be down the road. Well, let's just convert it to a for-profit. Right. So from the very beginning, we said nobody's going to own Civica. This is a democratized public utility that is meant to benefit the shareholders of society. And, and that, as a guiding initial principle, was powerful. Because what we said to health systems was, this is a problem you're dealing with, we're dealing with it, everybody's dealing with it. We were dealing with around... 200 to 300 shortages on essential medications every day. Mm. And so the market had just failed. And so when we went out and said, look, this is not Intermountain Healthcare trying to feather its own nest. A nest, in fact, there are a couple of guiding principles. Nobody's going to own Civica. The second one, everybody can join. Whether you're for-profit or not-for-profit, if you're an investor-owned hospital or not-for-profit, or you're a critical access hospital owned by the community, whatever everybody gets to join. Second, or third, everybody gets the same price. Meaning, Intermountain Healthcare, as large as we are, we're not gonna get a better per unit price than a standalone 10 bed critical access hospital in Kansas. Everybody gets the same deal. We wanna bring the benefits of scale to everybody equally. Right. What we also said was everybody's gonna get the same contract terms that Civica is prohibited from giving anybody who joins a better deal than anybody else on anything. So those four things, nobody owns us. We, we have a, um, we have everybody is treated the same, meaning everybody gets to join, everybody gets the same price and everybody gets the same contract terms. We actually hard coded that into the Civica bylaws. And the reason why I was insistent on bringing philanthropy in is that it would take a unanimous vote of all of our governing members, including the three major US philanthropies who are involved, to ever alter that deal. And that is so important for us because then we could say, hey, Intermountain Health Healthcare or HCA or Mayo Clinic or Providence or any of the large systems who helped start this will never get a penny of dividend. Mm. They're never gonna take profits. That the only reason to keep profits in the company are to fulfill its mission to make essential medications available and affordable to everybody. So that getting that right, now we have terrific guidance. People like former US Senator Bob Carey, mm -hmm. um, legendary individuals like Clayton Christensen and, and, and Don Berwick and, and others who stepped in and really helped us set up the guiding principles the right way. But when we went out to the health systems and we said, here's the deal, everybody said, that's fair. That's a fair deal. And we all work together, we, we sink or swim together, and that ethos is what's helped us move the market. And even today, I was just on the phone with the CEO of the health system last Friday, 
And he said, hey, we're having troubles. Can we join Civica? Of course. You know, do we get any different deal? No, nope. same deal as everybody else who is here day one. Our mission is to solve the problem for patients. And uh, we want any patient in the country, every patient in the country, when they need medication to be able to get them. That, Ira, I think was the key. Now, you know, when the Wall Street Journal came and said, we'd have never heard of anybody doing this before quite this way, mm -hmm. um, we couldn't find an example of it either. Um, it took us two years to get our tax exemption from the federal government because they couldn't think of an example either. <laughs> um, and so they were waiting to see what, what happened. But we have our tax exemption. We think this is a new model of um, a societally responsible free market mechanism yep. to essentially help regulate a market sure. and, and to govern, not govern the market per se, but actually bring fair principles to a market. We compete like anybody else. But what our members are finding is that is that there's a, the value proposition, the clarity and simplicity of the model is, is meeting people's needs. And, and frankly, I the model was held up so beautifully during COVID. We, we, said, we said early on, there were a couple of things that we said, look, our goal is to stabilize supply first. So we are never gonna source from China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And two, second, we're gonna carry six months of safety stock for our, yeah. our entire membership group so that if there's a supply disruption, patients aren't harmed. And, um, and during this downturn, when there have been supply disruptions all over the world, Civica has, has not only met its commitment, but was able to ramp up additional production to bring more product to the market than, than expected. So we're just, it's been really fun to see the model play out. I, I bet, I bet. Uh, very impressive and uh, you know I was looking at um, uh, you know before how you know you originally had um, 14 drugs slated for 2019 you actually hit uh, 18 uh, 28 SKUs uh, the first that came off the line I believe was vancomycin which is a wonderful example just because you know when we're talking that you were talking about Darabin before but here we have you know drug of real drug of last resort um and you know that was sort of the flagship which was awesome uh you have you're predicting uh, around 100 100 new medicines in the next five years and it also talks about uh you know developing andas building your own manufacturing capability um these are a lot of new capabilities for you uh any interesting challenges when it comes to um to setting some of these things up i, I also now my next question is going to be about partnerships um but um, any interesting stories regarding uh, some of these uh, the challenges in setting up these uh, when it comes to sort of the, the brick and mortar manufacturing component of this and also the regular, sort of having a regulatory team that knows how to do these ANDs and get them done fast. Um, any interesting things there? A couple of stories that you might be interested in. One, almost immediately after we announced Civica in, um, in September of 2018, I think it was within a week. Um, Martin Van Trieste, who is the Civica CEO, who mm -hmm. frankly, I attribute mu much of the success, in fact, if not the vast majority of the success of Civica sure. to Martin and the incredible team that he has built. I, um, he started advising us in, in um, 2017 and he had retired. Um, he had retired from Amgen where he served as the chief quality officer and really has been a legend in drug manufacturing for many, many years, but he, he was retired and I persuaded him to kind of come and help advise us. And, and as we were getting ready to form the company um, and start for a C, search for a CEO, I, um, I approached Martin and just said, Martin, look, there's one person that everybody is going to agree that needs to run this company as the first CEO. And he's like, well, who's that? And I said, well, it's you. <laughs> he, said, he said, Dan, I'm, I'm retired. And I said, Martin, I know you're retired, and, um, but you're, you're the right guy. And um, I said, we think about it. So he spent the weekend, he called me, uh, I believe it was on a Monday, and he said, okay, I'll do it under three conditions, uh, with three conditions. One, I do not want to manage the board. I want to be... I want to be focused on, on making the drugs, bringing drugs to market. I do not want to manage the board. And I said, I'll do that. So I'll, I'll, he said, second, 
I want to get my own travel arrangements going forward because working through um, the Intermountain Corporate Travel Department is a pain. <laughs> I said, that's, that's easy. And then the third, he said, I want to be paid $1 a year, no more. Okay. And um, he said, I'm not doing this um, for money. I'm doing this because of the right thing for our country. And he, he committed right then that he would give us six months and it's been two years. And his, um, his engagement and energy and his passion for what for patients has really made this happen. The other thing that he did almost immediately is he brought a world-class team of experienced pharmaceutical executives that came. And now they're not all working for a dollar a day, but they're actually working well below market on what they would expect to make in the sense that there's no, there's no um, equity of stock options here. Right. These are people who, are, who walked away from very promising careers and knew the market who wanted to do something good. And um, for society, and, and I'm just, I, I love them all. Um, personally, deeply love and appreciate them for what they're doing. And, and, and frankly, the last thing you wanted was a hospital administrator trying to figure out how to make drugs. These guys know how to do it. They know how to run the market. They know. I've learned so much from them um, just observing. But um, this is a world-class team. Yeah. So that was a, a great story. What, what Martin and I started doing, um, really, as we started making the rounds in Washington, D.C. about what Sifka was trying to do, and again, we were not asking. The, the, the easiest meetings to have with Congress are meetings where you don't have anything that you're asking them to do. They all loved it, right? This is great, che cheered us on. Um, you, know, I, you know, I was good, telling the story, um, uh, what brought up Martin was the, the call we had with FDA soon after we announced Civico. There were about 100 people on the phone from the FDA, including mm -hmm. their entire drug shortage division. And Martin, I introduced Martin and Martin spent 90 minutes walking them through the model. And I'll never forget, one of the leaders of the drug shortage division said, you're gonna solve the national drug shortage issue with this model. And his next statement was, what can we do to help? Well, Martin said, look, we're not asking for any special favors, meaning we want you to follow the regulations and treat us you know, like the same. However, we had just applied for our national drug code label or code, our NDC code, which are the first five digits of the barcode of every drug that, that we would make. And sometimes it can take six months to get that. Well, we, we, Martin brought that up on the phone and we had it within 10 hours. Um, <laughs> it was, they just approved it. And, and the FDA has been marvelous in, in, in trying to help us meet our mission because they know we're not doing this to make money, we're doing this to prioritize patients. So that's been wonderful. The second thing I would say with respect to manufacturing, I it's been very fun. Um, we started meeting with the Assistant Secretary of Par Preparedness and Response and BARDA, which is the Bio uh, Biomedical Advanced Research Division under HHS, sure. really about the national security implications of you know, an extended drug supply chain throughout the world. We began meeting really midsummer last year with the folks at BARDA trying to think through how can we bring, bring domestic manufacturing of essential medications back to the US. And um, believing that 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 an over concentration in China was an issue, yeah. um, eighty percent of the world's pharmaceuticals come out of China, and um, and if you've noticed recently, they've been making threats that hey, do you want to treat your patients? Um, you know, and and I and I just don't think that that is makes sense, and neither does does the administration. So we began talking to them about how we might do this, and and really also bring active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturing back. Mm -hmm. And um, and really, that we were approached by them to say, look, if you, if you got federal funding, could you build a facility? Would you build a facility that would prioritize the needs of the country first in a time of a national emergency? And we, of course, said yes. And so we we did receive um, through a contract with the federal government um, the um, funding to build a, a manufacturing facility. Um, it will probably most likely be in Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, that will be able to make about 80 million um, vials and um, 50 million pre-filled syringes a, a year out of that facility that Civica will own and, and we will use to kind of fulfill our mission. But in time of a, of a national emergency, um, the federal government come and say, hey, we need you to make this and we make what the federal government asks us to make. 
And, and again, it's all part of being self-reliant and, and having a robust supply chain to make sure that, um, that we can treat patients effectively. Um, so that's been fun. And we're actually now just in the design process of that building. And um, in our board meeting coming up, um, it's actually October 2nd, we're gonna be, we're gonna be discussing getting an update from our team around that. So that's been fun. And I, I know the team is super engaged and excited about that. And, um, and that's something that a year ago, we didn't anticipate um, a new development. So anyway, there you go. Very exciting, very exciting. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's uh, in the amount of time you've been doing this to see all this coming together. And now, of course, with uh, with everything that's been going on, a la COVID and drug shortages, uh, yeah, to have uh, US-based uh, production for something of that scale that also has dual use, is, uh, yeah, it must feel great, uh, really, uh, very impressive. Um, the one other thing I just want to ask you about real fast, because I noticed, you know, obviously um, at the beginning, I you know, mentioned a little bit about sort of the, the extreme consolidation that's occurred in sort of the generic industry over the last couple of decades and sort of the, some of the, the, the old school names we don't see anymore. Obviously, uh, we don't want reliance on China uh, for everything. Um, I noticed you've been doing some interesting uh, partnerships as well, uh, not just with, with some producers here, uh, but also uh, some interesting uh, sort of uh, upcoming generic companies in places like Denmark, um, the Hikma company in Jordan, which has been growing substantially and uh, becoming a big name on the uh, sort of the emerging market generic scene. Um, any interesting com components of sort of the, the partnership uh, comp model, whether it's uh, existing companies or some of these emerging uh, generic companies that uh, you might want to mention? Yeah, I, I, I would think, you know, now we're two years into it, we, we think back and think, oh gosh, we were just brilliant when we set up this business, but we did not anticipate how receptive the existing manufacturers would be to Civica's model. And let me tell you what they were struggling with. So, when you have a shortage medication, let's use vancomycin. Vancomycin was our first drug on the market. I had the I actually have the empty vial from the first ever Civica dose of vancomycin that was ever delivered to a patient Excellent. at Intermountain's Riverton Hospital in September of, of last year. And that patient recovered and went home. And, um, and I love it. But that is a, a, you know, it's like the howitzer of, um, of intravenous um, sure. antibiotics. And, if you don't have it, people will die. And um, and so, you know, vancomycin was was on shortage for a long period of time. It was on and off shortage. And, and what happens is when the market starts to fail, the purchasers change their behavior. And so what happened is we would have um, Intermountain Healthcare, Mayo, every health system in the country. The moment they heard there might be a shortage of vancomycin, they would scramble to get all of it they could. They would just scoop up as much as they could. And what it did is it, it would clear off the shelves. The manufacturer would be saying, wait a second, what happened? Um, and it wasn't always their fault. You know, there's some issues somewhere else in their supply chain, but all of a sudden, all of a sudden the, the shelves are clear. And so what, what would happen is then, they, then the manufacturer would try to ramp up production Mm -hmm. And they bring a whole lot more vancomycin and nobody would buy it. Mm. And the reason why nobody would buy it is that companies like Intermountain and Mayo Clinic and others would have, would just buy and hold. And so the market signals about what to make got really messed up. And so you go to an oversupply situation, to a shortage situation, to an oversupply, the manufacturers are looking around saying, look, there's no predictable supply because they don't see the inventories that the market is holding. And so, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the demand signals got messed up. The manufacturers didn't know what to make. And the reason why I say this is when we said to the manufacturers, here's how the Civica model works. We are getting upfront five-year commitments for a minimum of 50% of the volume of every one of our members. Yeah. So Intermountain Healthcare is willing to say, we will commit a minimum of 50% of all of our vancomycin spend to Civica on what's called a take or pay arrangement, meaning we take the product, we pay for it anyway mm. for five years. Well, for a manufacturer who's not been able to figure out 
how much to make and it goes from boom bust boom bust where they lose money if they're exposed yep. they, they're always underproducing to not overproduce and what we found was these manufacturers like Exelia, like Hikma, said oh my gosh I'll take that deal 10 times out of 10. Mm -hmm, you give mm -hmm. me a fair price with predictable volumes over a long period of time, I can now plan my production schedules and meet your demand much more profitably. So we were able to do that and get lower prices on these drugs because we brought a predictable market to these guys. And so when I say we made a new market, Civica, all of these drugs have Civica labels, but we are essentially writing their FDA license and they become essentially a subcontractor for Civic and for our members. Mm. And that's how we've been able to move so quickly. We did not think that that would be an option, but the market was so distorted on the other side that manufacturer after manufacturer has come and said, I will, I love that model because we'll be fair. We want them to make a, a profit. We just want them to make a reasonable profit. Mm. And we want to make sure that that, that profit keeps them healthy and sustaining their production without gouging people, but we want them to stay in business. The other thing is Civica is not asking our members to commit 100% of the volume with us. The last thing we want to do is drive existing manufacturers out of the market. Right. Because then we would be creating the problem we're trying to solve. Yep. So it's been a really fun thing to see the market respond to a new, more predictable, fairer model. Now Civica will also develop our own drugs, um, and we are in the process of doing that. It'll be our own FDA licenses that we manufacture with our new facility we're building. But it's as much as anything is, is fixing the market failure that, that is causing shortages that have really brought these great manufacturing partners to us. And we're really thrilled by that. It really is, our goal was to fix the problem for patients, not um, take over the world by any means. It was to fix the, the shortage issues for patients. Absolutely. And I just personally, I've been delighted with the partnerships we've had. I was there. I actually made the trip to Copenhagen, Denmark, met with the team at Vexelia when they were manufacturing our first batches of vancomycin, and um, couldn't be prouder of the team that that's an extension of the Civic team that's working on behalf of patients. Outstanding, outstanding. Dan, uh, coming back to you now. Um, obviously, you know you've you've had the opportunity um, to meet fascinating people uh, so far across uh, your career, whether it be in law, healthcare, pharma, <laughs> politics. Um, anyone, it has to be one, the, a handful of people that you may want to shout out to mention uh, that have really served as uh, important uh, inspiration, uh, influencer, mentor to you that, you know, if it wasn't for them, you know, Dan Lillenquist would be um, off doing something to totally different at this point in time. Anyone you want to mention at this point in time? You know, um, Ira, there's, there's one for sure that comes to mind. Um, and I have a lot of them. Look, obviously, I've talked sure. about Martin. I've talked about other folks that, you know, Don Berwick and, you know, Tom Daschle and others sure. who've come and helped us. And I, I love and admire them all deeply. Um, but maybe the person who's had the most profound influence on my, on, on my business thinking was, was uh, Professor Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School. Okay. And um, Clay passed, he was on the Interrountain Board, Clay passed away um, last year and, um, you know, love him dearly. Um, actually, I can't overstate um, the influence he's had on my life. I met him for the first time as a, a law student, he came to the University of Chicago and met with a small group of um, law students and talked about his theory of disruptive innovation. And, um, and I had read all of his work and I followed him and, and really believed that the way he thought about the world um, really uh, made sense. When I ran um, and lost for the race for the U.S. Senate, um, I picked up his book, How Will You Measure Your Life, mm -hmm. which um, was not a business book, but a book about life. And, um, and, I, and I listened to that audio book 
twice, which I don't usually listen to, but it's twice in a row. And I, and I spent six months thinking about, as I was considering what to do, thinking about how I wanted to measure my life in light of all I'd been through in the plane crash, et cetera. And, um, and he had a profound influence on me. To bring that full circle, I'll never forget the day in October of 2017. When I went to uh, um, to his offices just outside of Boston, and I sat down with him for the first time, the first conversation I had with him, um, outside of group conversations, I mean, I don't think he even knew me, but I knew him, and I sat down with him, and I said, Clay, here's what I'm working on. I told him the idea of Civic Academy. Clay was a very tall man, he was six foot eight, and um, he had had a stroke and struggled with cancer and had diabetes. And I remember sitting across the table from him and he stood up and he said, Dan, do you, do you mind if I stand up? Hmm. And he stood up and he, he used this cane, he took a couple of steps and I could see his mind just working. And then he leaned over and he was a man of great faith and he said, um, God bless you. Hmm. I will do anything I can do to help you. And he, he also shared with me, he said, I have prayed my entire life that my writings would inspire idea, an idea just like Civic. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, from a guy who I considered a mentor just through his writings, um, that was one of the highlights of my life. Um, yeah. Because um, to hear from somebody I loved and admired um, from a distance, and he became a tremendous advocate for Civica um, as long as his health stood up. And then I wish you could see it. I have faith that he can see it, but I wish I could thank him um, again for all that he did to help us set this up. And I, I love the man dearly. And, you know, and I think about, you know, all of us get a short time in this life, right? Um, sure. I think everybody's life seems short in retrospect, um, even if they live to be a hundred, right? Um, but I, um, I admire how he lived his and with humility he lived it with. And, um, and so he's, he's had a profound influence on me. And, and I still get emotional when I think about him. And I, I wrote all of those moments down in my journals and I reflect on those conversations. And, and there's probably another dozen people I could have a similar story, but that's the one that comes to mind. I appreciate you sharing that. Very, very inspirational and touching. And um, Dan, it's, it's, it's really a, a wonderful story overall. And I'm wishing you the best moving I said forward to the, the next uh, 100 SKUs <laughs> coming up the line and, 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 a, and a prosperous future for this model. Um, for, for everybody that's going to be watching this episode on the IDME YouTube channel or listening on the various podcast networks, you've been listening to Dan Lillenquist, board chair of Civica RX, senior vice president and chief strategy officer of Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, Dan, thanks for taking the time out of your schedule to to come talk and share this story with us. Um, thank you for everything you're doing uh, to, to move uh, this part of the human story forward, as we say, and um, you know, uh, pr protect uh, the, uh, not just the healthcare containment side of the equation, but uh, uh, human well-being uh, in the process. And it, it's really been a, a wonderful time with you. And, and once again, just thank you for, for taking the, the time to share everything with us. Really, really extraordinary. Hey, Ira, well, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much and good to be with you.